Right, so we're going to talk about global equity positioning. I think um, to put it in context, we've uh, this will run for about 10 or 15 minutes. So we'll try and keep it tight. Uh, I think most of the people have stayed on uh, to watch the presentation and to listen to the views. Um, just to remind you that these presentations will be available separately um, if you want to go through more detail. And in addition, your uh, wealth representatives at Anchor will be able to give you um, uh, copies of it. So over recent weeks, my inbox and personal conversations have been dominated by people asking where the best investment opportunities are in the aftermath of this market collapse. So in this presentation, we review the asset classes across major geographies uh, with a focus on equities. So there are a few principles we apply and assumptions that we make in our assessment. Firstly, we assume the world will return to normality. In Warren Buffett's uh, presentation at the annual Berkshire Hathaway AGM on the weekend, he referred to the current period as an interruption of growth. So the world hasn't ended, the world will recover. And uh, Buffett made lots of references to kind of the last five or six instances like this that he's experienced over time. So the world will resort, revert to growth. We're avoiding assets where longer than expected reversion to normality um, will damage the business permanently. And we're avoiding areas of high risk. So there's no need to be taking big risks when there's so many opportunities around. There's also great merits in being patient. If you have investable money, you have time in your hands. Um, and we think the market will be volatile for, for at least the next three to six months. So we're not getting overly anxious when markets decline. This presents opportunities for us, but we have to be prepared to act and you should have cash available to do so. We're also not getting FOMO when markets rise and we're not fully invested. Volatility will prevail for some time to come. So also be prepared to sit on your hands when necessary. So starting from a global perspective, firstly, low risk assets generate no or even a negative return. Global bond developed market rates are basically zero to negative and cash in the bank offshore, ironically, is going down in nominal terms. So if you don't allocate some cash to riskier assets like property and equities, your wealth will erode in real terms. This scenario will prevail for a long time to come and interest rates globally simply cannot rise meaningfully. So when and how do you invest in equities and property globally? The first point to make is that the change in environment has impacted many companies and sectors differently. And I think David's done a good job of explaining that scenario to you. So it's certainly not a time for index investments. You want to buy underlying equities. Oil, cars, pigs, and sugar, for example, are in massive surplus, and we've seen their prices plummet. But some companies have had their turnover uh, hit to zero, and the environment's been very positive for some. Amazon's first quarter revenue was up a remarkable 26%, and that's for one of the biggest companies in the world. So some caution is currently warranted in global equity investment. There's a lot of money to be made in these conditions, but investors should probably wait for further pullbacks. March 2020 was one of the worst months ever on global markets. And April, as you saw, had a big, a, a big bounce back. And in fact, April was the best investment month in the last 33 years. The bottom line is that year to date, the MSCI world is down 12% at the end of April, with the S&P only down 9%, which many would consider a far better than expected outcome, um, given the height of the virus fears. We believe global equity markets started the year in fully valued territory and at an index level and with prospects now far worse, markets as a whole are certainly not in great value territory. Earnings in 2020 will be under immense pressure and 2021 looks uncertain. Great businesses will return to normality in 2021, but some of this is already factored into share prices. So everybody we speak to in South Africa and here in the UK has been caught off guard. And this slide shows you, it's now about a week out of date, the 22 million unemployed, uh, in, in 22 million new unemployed in America, I think that's now up to about 30 million. So the, the overwhelming majority of people are expecting equities to go lower from here. No one's buying the market rally. Uh, Jay Powell in the US has been pouring cold water on the hopes of a V-shaped recovery by stating there's considerable risk to the economic outlook over the medium term and 30 million people in the US are now unemployed. So how do we play global equity markets? Um, number one, don't sell your long-term growth companies. And we believe very firmly to hang on to good quality, 
uh, companies over time to ride the dips, uh, and these companies will compound growth over time. In our funds, we remain focused on buying great companies at good prices, and these certainly are presenting themselves below the index level that we're talking about. We're excited by these opportunities, um, but in many instances are awaiting further uh, full, uh, pullbacks to increase our exposure. And certain sectors of the market have been strengthened over the last two months, and David Gibb talked a lot about that. An addition that we've, been, uh, we've added to our offering to clients is a recovery portfolio. So while the market's only down uh, kind of 10% to 20%, depending on which market you look at, there's a lot of great quality businesses with long-term growth trajectories. Who, and, and we think these businesses will be the same businesses in a year's time as they were three months ago. And as you can see on the red chart, a lot of these companies are down 20 to 50%. So this portfolio would run alongside a kind of core equity portfolio but we have had many clients who are looking for a way to play the recovery, and we've put this in place. Global property is an interesting equation. Many tenants are not paying rent, especially in retail. In South Africa, you're seeing uh, property companies here indicate that they've collected only 60 to 70% of last month's rentals. And many are questioning whether the same amount of office space will be required after the lockdown experience. Global listed property shares have acted similarly to global equities and are down around 20%. The issue with property companies is that generally high levels of gearing mean that prolonged periods of reduced turnover can have a significant negative impact on net asset value per share. So diversified listed property companies might well be a good way to play a recovery, but it should be restricted to quality players. Anchor's got significant intellectual capital in the property space, and we're very excited about property over the next few years. We've been chatting to quite a few guys around the world, um, you know, and they're indicating that blood on the streets, um, there's more to come. But that also means it'll be great bargains to pick up for people and to invest in physical property. Property's got a powerful role to play in a diversified portfolio. Strong, predictable, compounding, and growing cash flows are available with the right tenants and the right leases. So while listed shares might be a good way to play the recovery, we believe the direct market will be particularly attractive. And the anchor tenant team is identifying such opportunities and will present global and local opportunities to investors over coming months. Now moving over to the local market. South Africa is in a very different space uh, to, to develop markets where, as Nolan explained, investors can earn a very attractive real return by investing in income and bond products. This also means that one can be more patient with the equity investment. If you're sitting offshore, there's a lot of people very, feeling very anxious that their money is going down in both nominal and obviously real terms. The SA market, measured by the Cap Swix Index, bounced by 14% in April, and to end April is down 16%. The direction in SA markets is likely to follow global markets, and the RAND is likely to weaken if global markets weaken, and vice versa. When the world is more comfortable that normality will return in a reasonable time frame, emerging markets are likely to outperform developed markets, and the RAND has the potential to bounce back strongly. It's important to look below the index level and understand that non-SA Inc. shares have recovered, that have recovered as opposed to the South African shares. This is not surprising as the price of many of these shares is set internationally, and they've been dragged up by their international strings. It's vital to remember that when we talk about the SA market, there's a portion that is sensitive to SA economics and a portion that's not impacted. Consider NASPAS, British American Tobacco, Richemont, BHP Bulletin, Pulitzer, etc. These have nothing to do with South Africa. In our equity fund, only 26% of our holdings are sensitive to SA economics. So when people talk about the SA stock market, and there's only, uh, in, in our world, about a quarter of it where we are choosing to expose ourselves to the SA economy. We've retained this 26% portion because they're trading at once in a decade valuations. SA banks and insurance companies are strong, and it appears that more than the worst case is factored into many of these companies, and that's where we hold positions. We've removed almost all the shares in our portfolio, um, which can really take a massive balance sheet hammering and face permanent damage and from the, the, the COVID taking longer than what we expect. A share that we've used as an example, there's quite a bit of data here, but perhaps to point you to the bottom right-hand corner, where 
Vodacom is up for the year, but MTN is down 40 to 50%. The telecom sector has been a safe sector around the world. And as you can imagine, the use of uh, telephony and data has gone up significantly. But MTN, with 27% of its business in Nigeria, has acted like an oil proxy, because obviously Nigeria will be significantly impacted. So they do have some dollar costs in Nigeria, but we think um, a reasonable outcome for Nigerian profits converted through into rands is probably down 30 to 50% over a time period, whereas the share price is acting um, as if there's a permanent damage to that business that will never recover. So this is an example of a rock-solid business. It's going to go through a period of reduced profitability, um, but you know, tens, tens of millions of customers um, a, a, a business ultimately that will see its way through in trading at a valuation that uh, we've probably never seen in our lifetimes. So the last month of the JSC was characterized by extreme volatility in the sectors with the highest degrees of operational risk brought, brought on by COVID. In other words, the South African cyclicals, which through the volatility uh, continued to disappoint and the winners were more of the same from the sectors that have provided much of the performance for the last 18 months. So the winners in April were NASPAS Process, the Platinum Group Metals, Gold, and British American Tobacco. And that's left behind the SA Inc. shares. And while we focus on long-term investment in our philosophy, the current volatility and pricing of shares is presenting us with shorter-term opportunities. In SA Equity, our actions have been to increase the defensiveness of the portfolio, reducing exposure to companies with weak balance sheets, not yet fully reflected in prices, and those which face immediate threats to their existence. And where we can, increasing exposure to those leading franchises that should emerge from the crisis in better shape on the other side, or at least where we are confident that they will in fact emerge. An interesting observation globally in the March sell-off and subsequent rebound in April was that value tended to underperform growth. As part of our strategy, we think this multi-year trend of growth outperforming value is likely to persist, although we don't manage factors that sim simplistically at a portfolio level. In the last few sessions during April, we started to see some more buying coming in for the names that had been severely sold off over the last six weeks. So in our fund, in April, we sold some Fashini, Nedbank, Bidvest, Home Depot, and Discovery, and bought some growth point first round, Old Mutual, Quilter, and Sabania. On the radar, we're trying to wrap our heads around Bidcorp. It went into COVID, a fantastic business, but we're trying to assess its long-term future, um, given what might ha happen to, to restaurants. The underperformance of the South African economy has resulted in the continued narrowing of the investable universe in South Africa, with the index becoming increasingly concentrated to a small number of large cap, mostly exporter rand hedge type stocks. And in the short term, it's unlikely that this trend breaks. However, it's likely that over the medium term, the underperformance of domestic companies will reach an inflection point and will return to growth once more. It's human nature to extrapolate a negative trend into perpetuity, but seldom works out that way. So on to our last slide and a quick little look across emerging markets, which is of interest. China, we think, will keep chugging along, uh, but the structure of the economy is very different to 2008 and 9. so the policy response needed to reflect that. Looser monetary conditions front and center. The relationship with the US, its biggest trading partner, is rapidly deteriorating, and this trend is unlikely to happen anytime soon. Brazil as a country is not in a great place. Going into this, they were the big reform story of 2020, and investors were getting very excited. This has unraveled, unraveled in dramatic fashion, with political and social unrest at Bolsonaro's handling of the crisis. Oil crashing has obviously also not helped the situation. Russia will be okay, and quite an interesting one. Um, oil crashing has not helped their fiscal situation, um, but the country has been building reserves for the last five years. They've got no external debt and are running twin surpluses. It's difficult to find a stronger balance sheet, interestingly, from a major economy. The oil collapse was not good for them, as this is their biggest export commodity. So they will go into a recession but the government have more than enough at their disposal to stimulate fiscally. And the oil will eventually rebalance and find a level higher than where it is now. India, lots of social unrest at the handling of the virus, similar to South Africa, where criticism has been directed the economic sac uh, sacrifice brought about by the government's lockdown measures. They will suffer a recession this year, 
But again, their banks, like many other places around the world, are in far better shape than they were a few years ago. So above all else, uh, we need to remember, the world will reopen, life will get back to some form of normality, super rugby will return and things will be okay. The world's just going to have to figure out how to cope with all the extra debt.